Good afternoon, everybody. Nice fed, watered, or juice stuff. <laughs> right, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a um, panel discussion and just a couple of things. I am not going to say much because I'm the chair, so I just facilitate the conversation. And your contributions, I would like them to be questioned. Not like presidential campaign speech. <laughs> so questions, and the same goes for our esteemed panelists. Let's just try and answer so that we can, you know, get a nice little reasoning done, as we say in Rasta Barad, we need a reason. We can get a nice reasoning done because, as I said, for me, it's just been such a beautiful couple of days. So let's just keep the vibe going. Okay, everybody good? Yeah. yeah. If you're anybody that talk and then I go on and then you think them done and you know like in them old movies when the man dead and get up and <laughs> <laughs> you know like them can dead, one of them things. We, just, we, we give them the Jamaican applause. So if you ever go to Jamaica and they applaud you like this, it's not celebratory, it means come off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so First, I want to say, and it's really interesting, so I'll start with my brother Martin, because yesterday we had a very interesting discussion about, and Gabby raised it in, in her presentation on Living Wood, and it was, do we have a right to almost be pessimistic in some ways? Do, do, we, have, do we have to embrace that notion of almost like pessimism as part of our journeys as members of the human family? in our everyday learning experiences. And Paul raised it as well when he said, is it pessimistic or is it fatalistic? Mm -hmm. And Martin kind of had me, you know, some of you might have seen me and I might look whatever, but I was really thinking about what Martin was doing. And he kind of put me in that place where I really start to appreciate what we were discussing yesterday about pessimism or fatalism. But crucially, they're not the end point. They're part of that journey. So that's what Martin's presentation was saying to me. So I'm not guiding the discussion, but I'm just trying to sum up very quickly. Um, and then we had Levi, well, why? <laughs> but what I really liked about um, Levi, and it's really interesting because when Levi was speaking, a lot of it was about language. And it was about the power of language and the power to define. And more importantly, are your, let's say, your, your, your cultural ways of being, are they appreciated within certain arenas? The difference between enamel and? Enamel. <laughs> <laughs> but, but crucially, the thing that Levi said that really got me, and I tried to write it down so you can finish it for me, my brother. Yeah. You said the power of language um, Pictures that are painted when words are something are being said. When words are being translate said. the images. Yeah. So, so. The, um, no, you're going to get your chance. In that <laughs> <day>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because because what? No, said. because you know what it is. If you're thinking about, if you, if you're working with a child or a young person, and you want them to know this is a cup, you cannot start with C U P. You have to start with the vessel. Mm -hmm. Then they turn the pictures into words, and the words make sense in pictures. And when Levi said that to me, I thought, isn't that such a fundamental way to get us to appreciate the fact that language is not natural? Language is constructed. That's why we have so many different languages. So when Levi was, was, was talking and weaving all those wonderful tales, most of us could picture them. Okay? And then, you know, Michael, for me, kind of solidified some of that. There was so much going on with um, what, Michael said, what Michael said, but the thing that, I, that he really made me kind of think about was simulification. And that means, so in Jamaica, they would say, your fear about smiley pygmy. Look how wonderfully dressed you are, okay? But the crucial thing about when, when Michael was doing it, because he also played with these notions of reputation and respectability, and I know them in the context of uh, Caribbean anthropology, so the wonderful Jean Besson and Barry Chavans, when they talk about reputation and respectability, 
it works in, 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 in the way that, let's say you're poor. How do you separate one poor person from another? <laughs> if you're all poor, all of you are in a village and you're all poor, so then it might be, this one can sew, or this one can make donkey, yeah, or whatever. But there are ways that you bestow respect and respectability. But what Michael did for me that I never thought about before was, you know, you, you mentioned that the front room now has been replaced with, it was replaced with African-centered stuff, and I'm part of that room, in our room. We started to get Ras Daniel Hartman pictures, Rastafari, and put them in our room. But I thought to myself, what is the contemporary manifestation of the front room mentality? And in my humble opinion, you know what it is? Seeing brothers, but mostly sisters, at the bus stop on a Sunday, and you know they're going to church. Think about it. Who do you know is going to a church on Sunday? Who do you see dressed up and regaled in a way that they would have been for 30, 40 years? Mostly African and African Caribbean people, yes or no? Mm -hmm. And you, you really made me think about how those things can be linked to that whole notion of smartification. Because you could be at home and have no clothes, no money, but when you're going to church, even if you have to walk, you know, in that context, how you're supposed to present yourself. Yes or no? Yes. So you really kind of um, made me think about that. That's why I've, I've made, you know, I've got here Goffman, dramaturge, front stage, backstage. Backstage in the house, you can be in your tear up top. Yeah. Front stage, you're going church, Lord Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to kind of leave it there. Let's just open up. So all I'd like you to do is just raise your hands and we'll take your questions and see how many we can get through. So I don't know who wants to kick yourself. Well, we're done. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Right? Yeah? So um, Prof. Jane. But we also need to give a lot of respect to because I met Prof Jane four years ago, I think, when yeah. Kenny did the thing at Wilson yeah, and, and College. Martin, it was great. And Martin as well. Yeah. So. I, I, I mean, you all talked about things, this intergenerational thing came through everything that you were doing. And you know, you know, I, I spoke to you a bit, Martin, but you know, you made me cry again, like you did when you came to Wilson a few years ago. But, but. How, how are we going to move from your sort of despair and, and you know, I think especially you were talking, you know, to something which is somehow enabling and, and giving something, some hope? What were your, your three words? Just, just very briefly on that. Um, I've done a lot of work, Paolo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, mm -hmm. Bell Hooks' Pedagogy of Love. We have to learn how to do it. I didn't know how to love. I didn't know how to be loved, how to be hugged. I had to learn it. And I think there's an assumption that somehow if it's nice and you feel comfortable, but if you don't know what that is, and I think that we all need to learn and take time because we're so busy. So for me, we need, when we're in the classroom, we need to learn to love safely and comfortably. But in the, in the world in which I work, these young people I work with are nihilistic, they hate. So for me, we all have a responsibility. Because all I can say to, to close on that is that it was very distressing to perform it because it, it, it ceased to be a performance because I regressed. But when I came out of it, you guys came up and said, how you feeling, how you doing? And I, you've reset my buttons. So it happens organically. But I'm suggesting for people like me, and I can't speak if, you, if you're not like that, we have to learn how to love, but you have to be shown. And when you're in your 60s and you've just about come to it, it's very hard when you've got all of the layers of the PhD and your status to peel it off and just accept something like a handshake or a love from somebody who's not like you or somebody that looks like you but is, they don't like you because you, they said you're too rough or you're too raw. So for me, we have to learn to love and be shown. But in my experience, we've become quite inwardly selfish that we'll only like to teach people who we feel comfortable with teaching and not go through the hard reality that some of us need it fed in a hard, we need that hard and tough love, but with the, the outcome where we can feel better. Because finally, the statistics of suicide, self-harm, 
all of those things that I research as a man would demonstrate black men commit suicide more than black women. Because we have toxic masculinity and slavery colonialism took out empathy. It took out all of those things and it's manifested now. So I'm just saying we have to learn to love and we need more space to learn to love. And that's why I love the music yesterday because it's the music that brought me back to, yeah, I felt confident. I wasn't being judged or shouted at. So more and Zynga sounds. And people like Les, because what I love about Les, Les tells you the truth about who you are because when you're struggling, you need the truth. So I think we need to have more truth, more learning about love mm. and, and just get it done. Okay. Nice, I think that was great. <laughs> Anyone else? Who's, who's next? Otherwise, I'm going to start DJing. Yes, <laughs> Dr. Audrey. Hi. Um, I know you've done the work on the traditional interesting nation front bridge. Over time, our front room, my front room, as you, we've gone through the that period, I should say, the Afrocentric period, but we're in another space in a way. And as you were talking, I was thinking, what did my front room look like? It's kind of not like hey, that or that. <laughs> totally, you know, it's kind of a wolf, something, something. So is there work being done on the sort of nowish, you know, mm. eclectic, this space? Because this yeah. space is a yeah. really different kind of moment. Yeah. I'd like to reframe my response in relation to the title of this panel, which is Resistance is Performance. And I think it's performance as resistance after bell hooks, this idea that performance is opposition. And we are, how we perform that is style. The black body is always on view. Someone will give you something to gaze at. From an art, looking trash and ready. Okay. That's partly the church, but we're on the street anyway. Yes. Why the home is so important is that we portray it as if we live on the street and we don't have any values and values. No home to go to, that is important. Yeah. I think we continue that. So yes, the front has disappeared, but the values happened. It hasn't disappeared. No. It's still there. But, but it's you're saying it's moved into something else. Yes. Yeah. Is there work yeah. being done on the, this nuance, this space? Um, this kind of... Respectability is still there in the mix. Yeah. And it's gendered. Style it's often gendered. Creativity. I think the respectability is gendered because I think men have the privilege of reputation. A reputation is something you can take off and it's the thing you wear tonight. It's not tomorrow. You know? What's done in Vegas stays in Vegas, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Respectability is more transcendent. It's much more longer lasting. I feel that's gender that you need to get Interesting if, if you look at Hold on a minute. Sorry, sorry, sorry I thought you said Thanks. sorry. Um, um, style is there, respectability. Mm. Um, and how that's played, and I think we, and it's disruptive, actually, as well. We transgress it. So I'm interested in things that transgress respectability. I brought in other kind of identities, whatever that equate or so on. People are questioning that now. I think that's exciting. Um, and other kinds of identities. Um, but you talked about respectability is very important. Stuart Hall talks about this in relation to poverty. And part of respectability is self-respect. Mm. That we don't want to be from the gutter. We're just a step up from the gutter. Mm. That is important in how we display that. Mm. But we're also doing that to each other. Look at them, me have this, you don't have that. Mm. And we think, I'm the only one with that vase. <laughs> but actually, yeah. it's not true. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. 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 But so, that... that, that um, because I, as I said, I do want to kind of keep the, the, the answers and questions so we can flow. Yeah. But it's Peter J. Wilson, Crab Antics, isn't it? Uh, those of you who aren't familiar, you know, crabs in a barrel, they pull each other down. There's, a, there's a, loads of car carrying anthropology around that, yeah. about that crab antics. Because if the only thing you've got to measure, re reputation and respectability, are, I don't know, you got the gift of the gab, or you can do this, or you're the fastest runner. Mm. Then it doesn't open a doorway for others. There can only be one fastest runner. There can only be one. Like, what happens to the others? They try and pull me down. So it's that crab antics thing that is factored in. But I think on um, Audrey's point, the, the the question is probably the answer is no. It doesn't look that anyone's looking at the, the 
because there's a change, isn't there? New one. It's really interesting yeah. to see because you still have that special room. Yeah. Room. Yeah. yeah. And it's dressed yeah. in a particular way. I mean. Well, I don't. I must say, I don't. Well, when I say you will, your own particular way. That's what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because I think the crucial well, thing answer, that was. Well, that's you see. Your it's own true. Way. It's true. But I think the crucial thing that was also. I know Michael's covered it, but it wasn't. It didn't manifest today. Is that those rooms are locked? Yeah. <laughs> They're locked. Yeah. So one of the first things that I did was I have no locks on. Yeah. The only lock I have is in the bathroom. I don't know anybody got me. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have locks, and this was a conscious decision because yeah. all our rooms, especially the front room, was locked, yeah. and the only person who had that key was usually mum. And the phone. Yeah, and the phone with the lock on the phone in the lock room. Anyway, so anyone else, any other uh, questions for any of our panelists? Um, so I've got um, Tracy at the back and then, yeah, so Tracy. Um, it's a thought and I'm, it's not totally clear, but I'm just wondering how resistance has changed. So I'm thinking about Levi and your connection to Liverpool mm -hmm. and that heritage of activism. And, you know, how has resistance changed now in terms of performance? Is it more celebratory? Mm. How, what has the transformation been? Have you seen the transformation now in terms of our activism, in terms of our resistance when it comes to performance? Yeah. Um, I, I would say <clears throat> it's a traditional thing that is passed down from one generation to the next. So we produce people like John Lennon who wrote the song, Imagine, and that was revolutionary. And, and there were people like Derry Wilkie who inspired the Beatles, because the Beatles used to write standards, yes? <clears throat> and Derry Wilkie, was, we were getting music from America. So, you know, Fats Domino, various artists, and the music was shifting and changing. And so people like Derry Wilkie, we were talking about it, I think, yesterday, who put the beat in Mersey beat. And it was, um, it was black people in essence, you know? Liverpool, because of the docks, has had different communities come in, the Irish, African, Caribbean, Chinese. And because of the situation with the British, because like I say in my talk, when I was talking about Shabins, we weren't allowed into regular clubs. Brother Michael had a shirt on yesterday more blacks, more Irish, more dogs, <laughs> you know? So that vibe was there. So people have always been, yeah. you know, a protest mood. And then, plus the trade unions were big in Liverpool. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, so I just kind of fell into that. And, and the thing of what Martin was saying about <clears throat> um, learning to love, it starts with self. And if you can't love yourself, you can't love anybody else. And that's not a narcissistic thing. It's a reality. How can you love somebody? It's like when you're on a plane and they say, if it's gonna crash, look after yourself first before you help anybody else. Because how can you help your, anybody else when you're in distress? So it's about self-love. And, and it's about, once you recognize that with, with, within yourself, it's then, passing it on to somebody else, and then hopefully they will reciprocate that love. Mm -hmm. So when I write, as I said in my poem, you know, I think about my community. I think about my community. And I think about how I present my, because I, because in my poetry, I don't swear. I don't use, because my mom and dad used to come to gigs, and if I stood up there and F this and F that and blow beat and bump, <laughs> You're mad. <laughs> You're mad. <laughs> yeah. you know? so, so, um, so I'm always conscious when I'm writing that I'm writing for the community and not for self because I'm part of that community. You know? That's why I say my community is precious to me. I embrace her spirit. I always write with her in mind. This is how we do it. So, you know what I mean? so, but in the context of what Audrey was asking you, so how do you think that manifests now? That, that, you know, so for instance, if you look at Audrey with the big hank and stuff like mm. that, it's symbolic, but then because I know this sister well, 
I know it's not just symbolic, it represents mm. a, where she is yeah. in her journey to, you know, whatever that self is. So I think it was, you know, the question about how it manifests. But I think we could probably leave that there, because I want to see if we could get a couple more in. Oh. So we've got, um, no, we've got Jennifer. Jennifer. Okay, so I was thinking back to what Paul was saying yesterday about climate catastrophe mm. and this whole, you know, sort of apocalyptic vision that really kind of stayed with me because it was so powerful. And then we were talking with Max, I was talking with Maxine about the way that the front room seems to have like an internal world. There's a, the, you know, each thing yeah. represents something specific to each person in their memory and they're associated with the image, you know. So then, uh, so the question really is just in terms of the material, you know, what material can represent now mm. and the choices that are made, the memories that are, that are connected to it, to the specific choices that we make, and then connecting that to how our choices in terms of what we bring into the home okay. yes. can actually affect mm. the wider picture to do with climate. It, I think it's like a, a present question. That I so it's kind of like, I don't, I, so just to kind of yeah. clear in my head, so yeah. you're talking more ecological? Yes, that's right. And not and climate, like, say yes. you're talking about ecology. Yes, okay. ecology, and I'm thinking that that's actually very present, a present um, issue yeah. for this, the generation now that, you know. Exactly. And that, yeah. but we're all connected to that. So, yeah. you know, just thinking about it from an ecological perspective, <coughs> how we... Um, the choices that you choices make. The choices that we're making, yeah. 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 So, I don't know if you want to address that. Well, I think that's a really interesting... In a sense, ecology has always been there, but other people have been talking about it, but Western has never listened. Yes, absolutely. Repair culture has always been there. Absolutely. So let's repair our stuff. Mm. Cook. Yeah. I love the piece that Martin knew about the dumpling. Mm. Yeah. Cook food. Mm. All knowledge. Mm. Yeah. That has always been there. Mm. They just discovered coconut. They've just discovered <laughs> coconut. It's always been there. Yeah. We're the fierce humans, so we've been trying to tell them for hundreds of years about being human. And yeah. human. I'm not talking a, an, an enlightenment idea of human. I think it's a new type of being human. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I think something for me that's important is acknowledgement of transformation of society. African Americans colorized America. We creolized this society mm -hmm. from sound system to music to style. Absolutely. We have creolized the society. The issue is is that they love black culture. They just don't like black people. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But in terms of returning to the question of it's remembering that we are part of the global majority. We are part of the global majority. And there is climate injustice and there's climate environmental racism. Yes. I did a project about Ken Sarawiwa called the Doing Nothing is Not an Option. Mm -hmm. Ken Sarawiwa was an activist in Nigeria. He was executed by the Nigerian government for speaking against Shell. Shell have destroyed an area, the Agoni area in the Delta region of the night. Okay? Do we know about that? Yes. Are we aware of that? Yes. Or do we do not? How do when we do we see that as part of the issue yeah. here? Yeah. yeah. When we talk about climate. The way that the North, the rich North, condescends the poor South for using natural resources which the West have been exploiting for hundreds of years. Yes. And now want to tell us. Yeah. So how do we connect that? And I think hopefully that's connecting with what um, Paul was saying, but it's also how we're conscious within our material, the things we do. Yeah, absolutely. And the choices. The choices. Yeah. And we have agency. We yeah. all have agency. Yeah. Can I just add one thing to it? From a criminological standpoint, space for inner city people has shrunk. But the expansion of spaces like prisons, mental institutions. Yeah. So the psychology of having shrunken space. And then when there are spaces and they're compressed. So when you look at mental health and solitary confinement, when people have nowhere to live, like Grenfell Tower, what you find is the net result is an increase in mental health, suicide, violence. So what you find is when you look at urban geography, you don't have a racialized perspective in urban geography. I spent time at Johns Hopkins where they looked at that. 
So when you look at where the spaces we occupy and what we do within those spaces, we're corralled into spaces, mm -hmm. and therefore it upsets the balance of the way that you think. Mm -hmm. So even if you've got the intention to be, how can I put it, ecologically driven, mm -hmm. you've got CCTV. Mm -hmm. You've got the surveillance society that is voyeuristically looking at you when you do occupy space. Mm -hmm. Increased street lights, satellite imagery. So the impact of technology in restricting space mm -hmm. is also a challenge for young black people who nobody explains to them this, so they get vexed. And then they go to a bigger space called jail. Mm -hmm. So all I'm suggesting is the sociology and criminology of ecology mm -hmm needs to be brought back into mm -hmm. cultural studies and other areas, mm -hmm. so that at least designers of ecological space at least have an awareness of how the sociology of the impact of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've got Chantel, I believe. Yeah. So I'm useless with names, but I'll get them right today. <laughs> See that, okay. Um, yeah, on the point um, that Martin made, I wanted to ask... Can you sort of speak up a little uh, Yeah, I wanted to ask... Um, with Black Lives Matter and everything that happened and the change made George Floyd on social media, do you um, think that it's still true that the revolution will not be digital, or do you think that um, social media today will allow young black people to have that as their form of resistance? Well, if, if you look at Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, every one of them is owned by about six people. They're all white, they're all billionaires, they're now going to space. So if you look at the economics, if you look at it, trap, star, hood, rich, we actually buy into it, but we don't have ownership of the distribution of ideas. So unless you're going to, we had black Twitter for a moment and stuff like this. The reality of it is, if you look at the Germans in the Second World War propaganda, all that media does is use algorithms to collect your data that informs the police, how they police and other stuff. So, and here's the thing, during the riots in Birmingham, some white guys planned a little bit of a riot on Facebook and they did a four-year sentence. So when they recapitulate on Twitter, what's going to happen is criminal justice will expand the way that it criminalizes your ability and limits your free speech, whether it's the First Amendment of rights in the state. So the reality of it is, unless you raise awareness with black people, young black people, what they're getting into, what you and I both know, the intergenerational disconnect. Because on one level we say, you can't use your phone. And young people say, I'm going to use the phone. But what they don't understand is the technology that informs it, especially the web. We only use about 3% of what we see as the web. 92-3% is the web. And that's where the digital stuff goes up. So really, we need heightened awareness. We have digital poverty, but we don't have strong digital awareness. I think the only thing I would kind of add to that, you know, is I think we need to be mindful in the way we advise. Best example I can give you is when, when David Starkey said too many damn blacks, okay, I 100% believe that the only reason he lost his job and everything else was because someone tweeted, replace damn blacks for damn Jews and slavery for Holocaust, and he would never be allowed to work in the public arena again. His career was done after that. And I know for a fact, if it wasn't for social media, he would still be on the TV. And I'll tell you why. Because when he said all that stuff in 2011 about the so-called riots, about the whites are becoming black, so as if all black youth are nihilistic, etc., he got away with it. But he couldn't get away with it in 2020 or whatever it was, because people can put it out on Twitter. And I think sometimes we, I think we have the wrong conversations about who owns what, because to me it's about how do you use those tools? Because if we, if we reduce our activism to what we own and control, we're done. The other thing as well, what I always say to people, I always say this to black people, people of African ancestry, whatever, don't put black in the title of your stuff, black or Twitter. We wouldn't go punny. When we go punny for black Twitter, what does it even mean? Black this, black that. You know, we had Black Friday, Black Liberation African Knowledge Friday, because it was something in Lewisham for the community, and we got British-based black activists to come in and speak. That's what we did. But our company was called New Beyond Limited Learning by Choice. We did. We worked for. Organizations like Bernardo's, Sainsbury's, I spoke at Yale, Howard, New Beyond. Say New Beyond fast. It's New Beyond. 
<laughs> and produce what I want to do to me. Because I'm talking to the human family. I'm a member of the African branch of the human family. And to me, there are two things that should never be messed around with, okay? One is love, and one is knowledge. They should never be racialized. The reason why, to me, we're in the predicaments we're in now is because knowledge and love have been racialized. If knowledge wasn't racialized by white racist <coughs> Europeans, we wouldn't have to think about black history or whatever history. So I think we need to, you know, Audrey Lord, you can use the talk the master's house. You can use the tools to dismantle dismant the master's house. I think you just need to be careful in how we, we do that. I think that's it, isn't it? Sorry, <laughs> right, there you go. I shouldn't really have, I, yeah, I do get the last word, I mean, the cheer. <laughs> anyway, thanks to our wonderful panel and you all. Thank you very much.